Hey folks, now I know you've seen plenty of me on the show lately, but I bet you have not seen plenty of the Rover. Now there's a lot going on with this at the minute, so as much as I'd like to give you a quick run through of everything that's happening, there's really no such thing as a quick run through. I've already got the head unit out because I'm doing a whole bunch of other um, upgrades and work in the car. I'm doing a whole sound insulation treatment. There's more up under there that you can't see. And I've got this really, really nice, I can recommend this by the way, this is a Blaupunkt uh, Bremen uh, SQR46 DAB. It's got Bluetooth and everything, but it looks super retro, really, really nice. It, the only downside is it's ludicrously spendy, um, but that's going back in, which is why I need to rewire all the mess that was in here. And part of rewiring it is removing this little fader unit from the middle, which is why I'm taking this all out. Now it turns out the center console removal is not as scary as I thought. You can pretty much do it yourself uh, without really any worry. I did not know what I was doing when I came out here. I just sort of floundered around for a bit and figured it out. There's two screw holes in the little tray here that you undo. Uh, I've just left those there so I don't lose them. That then releases the whole rear end. There's two behind the trip computer. And this one you can get to really easily once you've taken the front cover off. Uh, the one on the other side, it's just sort of hiding away in there. You do have to kind of pry the uh, the housing of the trip computer out a bit. It's scarier than it, it looks scarier than it really is. It doesn't really seem particularly fragile. Mine hasn't broken any clips or anything, so I think you're okay. You don't have to get it out all the way. You can just kind of get it out part way and then sneak a screwdriver in past it. So that's uh, these two brackets here. And then there's two more down at the very front corners if you're really lucky. Uh, mine only had one because I think it's been a little bit neglected in its past. Um, don't do what I did and get tricked because there is, um, originally, I've removed mine because I didn't realize that I didn't have to. There is this metal kind of strip that sits on top there. And when it's all together, it looks like you have to unscrew it from here to be able to, to be allowed to take it out. But because it's only on pins and they are in open-ended slots, you can actually leave that in. So you don't have to undo that at all. You can just leave that in the car, pull the center console out. Uh, the gear shifter comes apart quite easily as well. There is a uh, little plastic, um, you know, lockout switch. Mine's actually broken, doesn't work. I can shift it with or without. But to get that off, you take the little uh, chrome cap off. Uh, that screw runs through the middle here. So you can just remove the screw and, uh, and this whole unit comes off. And then uh, the only thing you have to do after that is unwind the uh, the actual gear knob itself which obviously i've already already done here that's down here um one thing to be aware of when you unscrew this uh, eventually so this is actually I, I couldn't tell exactly how i haven't put the whole stack together but somehow or other uh this here is retaining um this button and the spring that was underneath it so when you undo it it'll get to a point with the spring and that cap just go boink up out the top and go absolutely flying obviously you know, we've got a roof there, it caught it, no big deal. And it's not a tiny spring, you know, you're gonna find it quite easily, but just a heads up, um, it's nothing nothing too horrible. So I'm gonna carry on trying to get this apart some more. I'm gonna stuff all of the uh, all of the wires down underneath it and get it all the way out and see if I can figure out how to get that handle off. And then I will get back to you in a second with how to finish this removal. All right, uh, small update on the handbrake. Um, it turns out the cover, you just have to have big He-Man arms, which I do not, and uh, just twist it and pull it off. It's not like clipped in or screwed on or held on by a little fitting in there or anything. So it is just brute force. I've moved it some um, by standing all over it very awkwardly uh, like this and just pulling on it with two hands. The downside is I'm pretty sure when it goes, my elbow is gonna go back straight through the fucking windscreen, but uh, I'll take the risk. And uh, yeah, once that's off, I'll uh, show you me taking this whole thing out. Uh, good news, there's a trick on the handbrake sleeve. Once you've kind of got it a little bit free, you can sort of get it, if you get both hands like this underneath it, rather than trying to grip it and twist, because obviously it is rubber, the tighter you grip it, the tighter it grips the uh, handbrake lever itself. But if you can get fingers under it on both sides, it does actually slide right off, uh, slides right off. I can't do that because obviously I'm holding the phone. But if I just put the phone down for a second. Straight off. Just so the phone falls. Just so the phone falls over. But yeah, nice and easy. And that pops straight off. And I'm guessing I'm still gonna need to disconnect my trip computer there, or maybe take the trip computer out. No, it doesn't go back through. So yeah, I'll have to disconnect the trip computer. But then I think the center console is completely free and clear because I've already removed 
everything else. I've actually removed the uh, connectors from the rear Siggy lighter as well. So this should come out nice and easy now, apart from that, uh, that cable on the center console. So, you know what, let's... Oh, I did that up tight, didn't I? Oh, actually, no, it has to be... Handbrake's got to be a good way on. Uh, now up. I release the handbrake lever down. Cool. That's got me a load of room. And yeah, the only thing left in now is the uh, connector for the trip computer, which hopefully has a nice little clip on it that releases it really, really easy. I do dislike these, uh, these spade connectors Rover use. They hold in amazingly well, which don't get me wrong, it's good because obviously they're not going to pop off in a hurry. But man, they're a nightmare to remove. I wonder actually... Oh, here we go then. That's a little tang. You press that down and it comes off a piece of cake. Learn something new every day. Um, so yeah, just going to see if I can find an easy release for the little trip computer wiring connector. And uh, we should be away. Wish me luck. All right, good news. It turns out that clip is actually really, really easy to remove. The wiring connector sits uh, this way up in the back of the unit and see these little slots in the top and bottom. Those interface with, he says, trying to turn the center console around without breaking anything, they interface with these little clips on the top and bottom of the connector there. So all you've got to do is get a hand in over the top, press in there and the whole connector comes off really, really easy. Obviously I would record uh, doing that, but again with one free hand and a, and a phone it doesn't really work uh, so that's a absolute piece of cake really really nice and easy it's um yeah i think it's a bit of an anti-climax really because i i was under the impression maybe maybe wrongly but i was under the impression that this is a fairly nasty job to remove the center console but honestly uh these two four uh six screws um the gear shifter spring and the uh, handbrake cover and it's all nice all, honestly it's all really nice and easy it's really simple i could have could have probably done this with a seat in still or that's, that's out for other reasons um so yeah if you just wanted to know how to remove the center console you can tune out now i hope you enjoyed now i'm removing the center console because i'm installing a new head unit as i mentioned earlier in the video and it is uh, as with most modern head units it has a four channel amplifier in it which means i don't have to deal with this little fader control uh, that Rover put in the middle, which I'm guessing is only there because the original head unit would have been a two-channel amplifier. And then to get fade control between front and rear, they ran it through this little uh, voltage splitter dealy. So when, you know, when it's in the middle, both speakers get full voltage, and then whenever you run it to one end, uh, either the front or rear goes, I'm guessing, through a resistor just to dump some of the voltage. Nice and, uh, and efficient, and I'm sure this gets pretty toasty if you've got it at, like, you know, half in one direction or the other. So these six wires here... Uh, there's the two, there's a left and a right running into it, and then there's two lefts and two rights running back out of it into the rest of the car, and I need to, uh, well, I need to unpick all of that disaster, and I need to run all four channels directly into my shiny new uh, ISO standard uh, wiring harness. And now when this plugs in, uh, this will draw four channels of audio from the amp, which will be generating four channels of amplified audio that it's getting from the head unit. It's a really, really nice um, way of working, uh, this whole system. All it is is just uh, this. It looks like a lot of wire because it's all really long. It's like a meter or a meter and a half or something of wire. So there's a lot there. But conceptually, it's, uh, it's actually dead simple. The uh, high level outputs straight from the head unit here run into um, the amplifier and it uses that obviously it's both a, both a signal to um, like it steps that down and then uses it to drive its own amplifier it also uses the presence of audio on these connections as a power on trigger so when you've got audio coming out of the head unit that triggers the amplifier to turn on so there's no separate like ignition uh, feed into it although i suppose it kind of gets that from the uh, from the power connectors here and yeah it's just tapping power out of a conventional iso block so i've got the um power half of the ISO connector here that I've wired in already. Uh, all I've got in here at the minute is the uh, permanent and switch lives. So I've got those three on little removable spade connectors. And these, sorry, that runs um, into this shared connector. And from there, it splits out to run both the uh, the head unit and the amplifier. Normally, you, you'd be a bit iffy with that because it could potentially be quite a lot of current. But being as this is only a fairly small amplifier, it's um, four... Uh, channels at 65 watts RMS a piece. It's only 240 watts in like absolute theoretical maximum and 
you know, with my little four inch door speakers, I'm not going to be able to draw anywhere near that. Although the, 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 the six by nines that are going in the back will quite happily eat some power, but the fours won't. Um, so yeah, you know, there's, there's not really much risk of overloading any of the, the power circuitry or anything. And yeah, it just kind of neatly taps in and you can imagine this sort of splitting two ways. You've got power coming from this connector both ways and then audio goes from the head unit into the amplifier and then back out of the amplifier uh, into here where it goes into uh, the car. So yeah, that's basically what I'm doing here. I need to unpick all of this disaster where I'm guessing someone, uh, someone's been in here before and I don't know if they tried an upgrade and got bored partway through or something, but I, I, I don't know why you'd uh, put this. Oh, that's an interesting one. Four chop blocks for one uh, one connector. But yeah, I just need to unpick all of this, send it all to the right places. And um, I guess at some point I'm going to have to figure out what I put in the place of this in my center console. I think I might put a, uh, a couple of nice high power USB ports. Um, I've got a whole bunch of gadgets that run off USB-C. I can charge my laptop and all sorts of other gubbins. So I'm thinking... If I get a uh, a nice high power um, 12 volt to USB C adapter and I sort of put that in in place, I'll have to like 3D print a little bracket to convert it from you know obviously I, I, it's expecting something that shape um, and you know USB car chargers tend not to be that shape, so I'll have to maybe strip the uh, car charger apart uh, just to get the circuit board out of the middle of it and attach that up under the panel there. But either way, I'm, you know, worst case scenario, I put this back in and it's just kind of dummied out and doesn't do anything. But um, it should not be the end of the world. So yeah, this is all quite easy. Um, new head unit going in. I, I can't get over this thing. It's um, far too expensive, honestly, for what it is. Um, but I think they, they charge that much because they know that there's nothing else like it on the market. You know, if you want something like this, if you want a, an 80s looking head unit with modern functionality, you know, it's got DAB radio, which I don't care about. It's got Bluetooth. It's got an auxiliary connector on the front. It's got two USBs. Uh, so you can have a USB uh, connection hardwired in. It's got hands-free calling. It's got a microphone that it ships with that you can, you know, send off and run wherever. I'm probably going to put it on my new headlining when that arrives, just by the uh, rear view mirror. But yeah, hopefully get this all buttoned up. I've got to get new uh, drivers for the front doors. So these take four inch speakers. I thought they might take a five. I was being a little bit optimistic. Um, I found data sheets for a few five inch drivers from a company called Date and Audio um, that do actually fit uh, this screw spacing. This is 128, uh, sorry, 118 mil, I think it was, that I measured across diagonally. And there are five inch drivers. Weirdly, it doesn't feel like that should work, but there are five inch or, you know, five inch in inverted commas, uh, drivers that fit that. The problem is that the uh, the lip on them runs way too far out. So this, my little four inch speaker kind of sits lost in the middle in this big ear gap all the way around the outside. That's why I wanted to put a five in was to fill up um, the rest of that gap so I wouldn't have this big ear annulus that I have to seal. But with a five inch driver, the lip on it carries on around. I mean, you can see obviously it comes out to there and you can imagine if that carries on around its way into, you know, this rib section there. So I don't want to have to modify my doors. I don't want to have to shave uh, the whole edge off of the speaker lips. I think I'm just going to deal with having four inch drivers. It does mean that the bass response in the front is going to be quite shocking. Um, I'm hoping I can fix that in one of two ways. Hopefully the six by nines in the back throw enough bass and it kind of survives bouncing off of the rear hatch and into the cabin and still sounds fairly good. The thing I'm worried about though is deafening the passengers. Like by the time I've got enough bass coming out of there for it to be nice listening to here, what's it going to be like, you know, for someone whose head is say there. So um, I think what I'd like to do is try and find a way to get a bit more bass out of the front. And there's a couple of ideas I've got in that space. Obviously the um, under region here, like whatever you call this space, there is a fair bit of room in here. And I'm wondering if it's possible to squeeze in, say, a six inch driver somewhere, not like a proper subwoofer or anything, but just a slightly larger driver in there that provides some of the bass. So a four inch door speaker can you know, kind of do its mid-range work from a couple of hundred hertz up. But the other thing that I'm thinking about doing, and this is maybe a little bit more weird, but certainly easier than putting a whole new speaker in here and, you know, messing with my glove compartment and whatnot, because there's a whole interesting thing with the SD1, by the way, if you're not an SD1 person watching this video, there is a glove compartment here. Like, it's a proper second glove compartment that, like, lowers down. And you can... um, It wouldn't be perfect if you were driving directly off a head unit. You probably wouldn't have the power for it. Um, most head units are advertised as uh, 45 watts per channel, but that's 45 watts peak. It's very, very rare that you'll find an RMS output off a head unit of north of 20. Whereas here I've got 65 watt RMS to play with. And obviously, you know, like a peak of, I don't know what the power supply in there is good for, but if I remember right, the peak is nearly 100 watt per channel. Um, 
so you've certainly got a lot more headroom on there and yeah you can just spend some of that headroom uh, trading off against the inefficiency of one of these like slightly weirder drivers to get that bass response and my thinking is if I can get decent bass response out of this speaker and maybe I put like a little A-pillar tweeter or something nice and subtle in there um, that should get me a really nice full audio spectrum in the front of the car that prevents me from having to deafen my rear passengers with bass just to hear some in the front so that's kind of where i'm thinking of going the downside is they're 45 pound per speaker for those little tang band four inch subs and i'm not sure i'm happy with that just as an experiment so um maybe i will maybe i won't uh there's a lot more other other bits and pieces i got to do on this car um obviously it needs a yeah needs a damn good clean really before i start doing anything else but um i think i'm going to get the old shop vac out and man, i don't even know what these are we like little shells of some seed or other or something how do these get inside the car like where do these get in here from i wonder if they're coming up through through the underbody you know does that get to the outside world somewhere but in any case i gotta hoover all this out clean all this out see if i can restore the carpet some i think i might actually lift the carpet um i don't know how it, it looks like it's relatively easy to remove probably held in by the vents i suspect and they look like they're pinned in little little plastic rivets or something if they are that sucks um i'd really like to get the carpet out and do a full uh soundproofing treatment on the whole floor because this is really quite tinny uh, and i suspect there's going to be a lot of uh, of noise from outside especially because this is an open air sill this is actually getting uh, outside air i think it comes through the uh through the blower so if i remember right the blower actually forces air into the sills i could be wrong but at the very least it's getting air from from outside somewhere so that means there's potentially a lot of engine noise road noise god knows what else getting into here and that's really not that's not going to eat much of the sound and the the carpet bless it it's there's no like dampening in here or anything so if i can get more of this uh, sound insulation stuff on there that would be great i mean i've i've massively overordered on this i thought i just i thought i'd get a couple of square meters to do the roof um <laughs> you really don't need that much I think I've used like a third or a quarter of my uh, of my stock of sound deadening, so I'm gonna yeah spend a bit more on the floor, try and uh, try and get some of the thrum out because if I remember right, the SD1 only has a uh, single skin floor. It certainly feels like it when I tap the floor. I can feel it uh, when I tap the floor from the outside. I can feel it on the inside, so it definitely like lets in a lot of um, a lot of road noise and wind noise and everything. So I'm gonna see if I can treat some of that out. See if I can get a bit more bass out of the front. If I can't, not the end of the world get those in, get the new head unit in, unpick all of this disaster, clean all of this out, um, see if I can get a new uh, gear selector trim made, because that looks minging. Um, I don't know exactly how that broke. I feel like whenever I pulled it down into first, this was coming uh, back so far that it was actually hitting the front of the fader unit, which I feel like it shouldn't do. I don't know why that could happen. I wonder if the transmission's mounted funny or if the linkages are a bit kiffed and it's all sitting further back than it's meant to like when it's in when i've got it in say second is that where first is supposed to be right and maybe when it's in park here is there meant to be a bit more a bit further forward so i wonder if this is coming back too far and yeah every time i'd pull it into first um which i'll be honest i did quite a lot because i quite like the sound that this six makes when you rev the knackers off it um <laughs> I think every time I pulled it into first, it sort of cracked a bit against the uh, the front of this fader housing. And this is pretty solid, like it's not giving out, not not when it's fighting against that. There's a little chip of it that I've picked up from somewhere in here. Um, so yeah, see if I can get any one of these made. It's not a very complicated piece, right? What is it? It's like printed plastic. In fact, it's got like a bit of shape to it. There is a bit of 3D, but I'll probably figure something out. And um, yeah, we'll see how it goes. There's plenty more to do. Check shop.pedalbox.show for all of our merch, and if you'd like to support us more directly, you can go to patreon.com forward slash pedalboxshow to support our builds from as little as a dollar a month. Make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell if you want to get notified when we put up new videos, and you can follow us on all the usual channels at Pedalbox Show. Thanks very much for watching, and join us again for another video.